Welcome, folks. This is Steve Adubato. This is the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour with my colleague, Mary Gamba. Mary, how are you doing on this beautiful Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m. as we were on AM 970, The Answer? I couldn't be better. Thank you, Steve. And how are you today? I'm doing great. You know, we've been talking leadership for weeks and weeks. And you ever notice that you never run out of leadership topics to talk Ever. about? I, every time that I think, hey, we might have covered it all, there's about 18 more topics that come top of mind. Yeah, and today we're going to be talking with our good friend Linda Bowden, who is the New Jersey Regional President of PNC Bank. Linda has been a leader in a lot of different venues, but being a leader in a very large, complex organization in an industry that is changing every day um, is going to be an interesting conversation. Also, I want to talk a little bit about the whole question of whether Linda thinks it's any different for a woman who happens to be in a leadership position versus someone who is a guy. Um, and she's so smart about leadership. She's one of those people in my book, Lessons in Leadership, you know I talk about lifelong learning. Um, Linda's a lifelong leadership learner. She doesn't stop. So while I'm bragging about her, I'm going to get this out of the way. Check out our website, stand-deliver.com, for articles that we never charge for on all a whole range of leadership, communication-related issues, and Twitter. Mm -hmm, absolutely. You can follow Steve on Twitter, Steve Adubato. That's A-D-U-B-A-T-O. And then on Facebook, Steve Adubato, Ph.D. Got it. So let's bring in uh, Linda Bowden, New Jersey Regional President, PNC Bank. How you doing, Linda? Hey, Steve and Mary. How are you both? Great to be here. Great to have you with us. Doing good. Linda, you know, one of the things that I've always known about you or noticed about you in virtually every public setting we've been in is you are upbeat, positive, carry yourself a certain way. And here's the loaded question. How much of your leadership approach is somewhat predicated or largely predicated on what I like to call your executive presence combined with your incredibly positive attitude. <laughs> well, thank you for saying that, first of all, Steve. And that is a very tricky question because I, I honestly think I am just basically a positive person. But I, I would also say that, you know, what that elusive term executive presence, um, that can come in many different shapes and sizes. Um, I've seen very quiet, thoughtful introverted people have a tremendous executive presence. I, I've seen people who are uh, boisterous and, and uh, really put themselves out there also have a great presence. So I, I think the key here is accepting your own style and embracing that and really leveraging that and knowing yourself. I, I truly think that is one of the hallmarks of a leader, knowing yourself, what your strengths are, and then really trying to optimize that, you know, and, and so... So from my perspective, um, you know, positive attitude does mean quite a bit. I do think it's contagious, but I would also stress that there are many styles. Okay. Uh, Steve Adubato with Mary Gamba on the line right now with us is Linda Bowden, New Jersey Regional President of PNC Bank. By the way, Linda, I've asked a lot of the folks who have joined us on the Leadership Hour this question. I want to run it past you. Where do you think uh, – and I'm going to try a different way. How much do you think your leadership style is predicated on how and where and who you grew up with? Well, you know, I'll tell you, that's an interesting question because I happen to be the oldest of four children. And mm -hmm. I think by definition, if you're the oldest, you're thrust into that leadership environment. Uh, and so I do think there's something to be said for that. I think much of it is your experience if you have the opportunity. And by the way, if I might say, Steve, just to sort of interject here, I think leadership is completely irrespective of organizational charts. Hmm. It really doesn't matter what your position on an org chart is. It's really about personal power, not position power. And so if you have opportunities, especially during tough times, um, to really take that leadership role, and by that I mean simply creating a followership, showing others perhaps the path, uh, motivating other people. Gosh, that could happen in, in any situation. And uh, if you've done that and if you've enjoyed it and if you've had success with it, I think there's an opportunity to grow with that. You know, it's interesting. The whole question of leadership and organizational charts. Someone says, you ever see someone in, in whether it's in middle management, whatever the heck that means, or someone at a, a let's say a lower level in the organization saying, I have to go to leadership to get the answer on this. And Linda just said, what are you talking about? If you're not a leader, regardless of your position in the organizational chart, you're not making the maximum contribution. Do you truly believe that everyone in an organization, regardless of where they are in the so-called org chart, 
has the potential and the responsibility to be a leader, Linda? Absolutely, because, you know, I don't think there's a narrow definition of that term. You know, I'm in, I happen to be in the banking world, and I have seen associates just starting out really show terrific leadership in a challenging customer situation. So often it's the example you set. It's, it's having other people take notice of the, the way you've approached a situation. So I believe that with all my heart, and I'll tell you, you know, as a leader, I try and give people that opportunity to shine in that role. Good one. Can we go back to how I started this whole question of – now, Lynn, Lynn has been on with us talking about women in leadership on the broadcast side on PBS and PBS stations and Fios and other platforms. But do you think in any significant way there are basic differences in the way men and women lead? Linda Bowden from PNC Bank. I, I do, and I, I will say I think those differences are uh, fewer than when I first started out. I think, you know, it's the old um, recognition of women tend to be very collaborative. There's there's more of a how do we work together on this. Um, perhaps, you know, men are a little bit more patriarchal in terms of a top-down sort of situation. You know, a great example of that, Steve, a few years ago, if you remember, uh, we had a, a, a we were very near to a government shutdown federally, and it was a very partisan situation. And it, you might have recalled the article; it was in the New York Times about the female senators got together from both <laughs> sides of the aisle, they sure and they did. sat there and they kind of figured the whole thing out because it really wasn't about who's going to win here and who's going to lose. It was very much about how do we come together and solve this problem. Um, now, as I said, I do see those differences really minimizing as we, we get um, you know further into this particular century, which is very encouraging. Um, but I do think we've been acculturated very differently, men and women. So mm -hmm. some of those differences still exist. Steve Adubato, this is the Leadership Hour. We're on AM 970. Uh, the answer you can every Sunday at 2 p.m., the second half hour of the Leadership Hour is, in fact, our series, State of Affairs, where we, in fact, talk to a whole range of state leaders in New Jersey about very difficult, complex problems. We're on the line with Linda Bowden, who is the president, uh, the regional president of PNC Bank in New Jersey. Mary, you and I were talking before, and I want you to follow up with Linda. We were talking about the challenge of keeping it, quote, personal, personal leadership in a very large organization. Steve and I, Linda, we were talking uh, just a little while ago when it is a large organization and you do have so many people that report to you and then there's people that report to them. How do you keep that personal connection? So, I mean, obviously you can't know everything about everyone in the organization, but how do you let them know that you genuinely do care about them as a person and they're just not somebody else on an org chart? Well, I, you know, I think there are a couple of things. It's a great question. I think, you know, first of all, I'm a firm believer in values slow down in an organization and ideas slow up. So the, the natural corollary to that is as a leader, you've got to be a good listener and you've got to be out there. Um, it's not unlike how we view our clients. We would never make a decision around our customers in terms of products they might need without getting out there and ensuring that we have a good understanding of their thought process. It's very similar with leadership. But you've got to be out in the field with people and listening to what their challenges are, listening to their ideas for how things can improve, and as always looking for those opportunities to, to recognize them for what they are doing, especially when they're doing it well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's amazing because with any leader, and any of us can think of any leader that we've known, and you can kind of tell what kind of leader it is by the stories that sort of grow up in the organization, that evolve in the organization about that leader. And those stories kind of take on a life of, of their own. If it's a, you know, if it's a tough person and perhaps not as, as personally oriented, you know those stories aren't mm. going to be as flattering. But gosh, if you, if you remember kindness, uh, if you remember when folks have a personal tragedy or are going through something tough and just show that you care, that goes a long, long way in terms of employee engagement. And it goes a long way in terms of creating that followership that you need to drive the organization forward. Quick follow-up. PNC has been involved with um, an initiative that many people know across this country called Grow Up Great. All right. By the way, a quick description of Grow Up Great, which our friends at PBS know very well. Go ahead. Grow Up Great. We are delighted. We put a stake in the ground over 10 years ago at PNC that we were going to make a difference in that space with children five and under. 
And so it's all about how do we give children a head start uh, at that age so that they'll simply grow up to be better students and better citizens in in years to come. The reason I asked is because as I appreciate, respect, the Grow Up Great initiative, and by the way, on the the television side, PNCA has been a long time underwriter in support of what we have done in public broadcasting. I often ask myself, when it comes to the Grow Up Great initiative, is it in part teaching leadership to kids five and younger? Well, um, I think, again, you and I are very similar in that we have a broad definition of leadership. That's right. So, yes, <laughs> within that broad You don't have to be the CEO. <laughs> you don't have to be the CEO, exactly. You uh, Leadership shows up in many, many different ways. Leadership might be, you know, one of the things we do is, is talk to children about how they treat each other. That's right. And that leadership can show up in terms of, kindness between two children. Turn-taking. Financial education. We've engaged in a great deal of financial education with young children, just showing them um, how to perhaps save, how to look at money, how to give to others, and then they themselves can be leaders by setting that example. So absolutely. You know, it's also uh, one of the great things um, in this Grow Up Great initiative. It talks about turn-taking. It talks about uh, bullying and standing up to bullies and and not being a bully yourself and and protecting those who are being bullied. I don't know if that's not leadership. I don't know what is. Um, and team building. Uh, Linda, before I let you go, uh, I, I've done this with you on television. I want to ask you the greatest leadership lesson you have learned, Linda Bowden, who is in fact the New Jersey Regional President of PNC Bank. The greatest leadership lesson is be bold. Fortune favors the bold. What would I do if I weren't afraid? And <laughs> and for me, I you know try and set that example. It is okay to make mistakes. It's okay to have fear, but don't let that paralyze you. Take take risks. Uh, if you're not if you're feeling too comfortable, if you're not making mistakes, you're not you're not stretching yourself far enough. That is uh, in fact Linda Bowden, who is New Jersey Regional President P N C Bank, a bank that uh, isn't just successful in terms of the bottom line, but it has shown its demonstration, it's demonstrated its caring and commitment um, to making a difference. By the way, the other thing, can we plug this before I let you go? Uh, the Governor's, um, the Jefferson Awards, please do that real quick, because I want to make sure people know about that. It's awesome. Oh, yeah. The New Jersey State Governor Jefferson Awards are really recognition of fabulous volunteers in the state of New Jersey. So every year we'll get many hundreds of of nominations and luckily i'm not a judge because that would be way too hard (laughs) we are a sponsor and we look for those people who have just not only made a difference but set that leadership example back to that word in the community and and i have to tell you these you you've been there these people are absolutely incredible in terms of what they do they are leaders by the way let folks know the website uh the, the the pnc website so that people can find out more about the bank and what you're doing Just go into pnc.com, and we would love to have you visit our website. And um, please feel free to uh, send any emails or questions my way. It's it's very simple, linda.bowden at pnc.com. And, uh, Linda, I cannot thank you enough for being part of the Leadership Hour with Mary and I. um, We we learn a lot every time we talk to you and wish you nothing but the best. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Linda. Take care. Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba, Linda Bowden from PNC Bank. We'll be right back on the Leadership Hour right after this. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Welcome back to the Leadership Hour. I'm Steve Adubato with Mary Gamba. We just were listening to Linda Bowden. That's B-O-W-D-E-N, the New Jersey Regional President. PNC Bank. Mary, one of the things about Linda that's always struck me is that not only is she smart, dignified, carries herself a certain way, but she's really nice. She is very nice. And so I sit there and I go, leadership and being nice, but she's tough too. You can be tough and you can be nice. And I love what you had said. Her passion and her energy and her positive attitude just shines through. Somebody said that to me once, and I, I apologize for whoever you were, but you said to me when I was on the phone with this person, I could tell that you're smiling as you're talking to me. And I said, what do you mean? And I was actually having a conversation like you and I are doing now. And it's just letting that other person know that you're happy to be there. You're happy to be in that room. You're happy to be on that call. So to me, that was what I feel when I talk to Linda. You know, it's interesting, though, but I, I know because I've known Linda uh, for a long time. She makes incredibly difficult decisions, 
and we've talked about this before, not every decision, in fact, many of them are going to make some people unhappy. Mm -hmm. But doing it with that positive attitude, um, it doesn't make it any less difficult to hear, but it is different if it's coming from someone who is carrying him or herself in a certain way. Yeah, and she had said that too. Uh, the values flow down and ideas flow up. It's letting your team know that we are all in this together, that even though this is a challenge, challenging situation for you and what you're going through, I'm in it with you. I'm not going to make you do something or, or deal with something that I mm -hmm. wouldn't deal with myself. Let's uh, talk about a topic that you and I have been saying for a while we want to talk about. You know where I'm going? Oh, I do know where you're going. All right. So here it is. Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba, this is the Leadership Hour. You're listening to us on AM 970, The Answer. So Mary and I are convinced that for every leader, for every organization, every team, there's always the one. Yes, and that's also in life, in friendships and relationships. There's always that one. The one what? In work, it's the one, it could even be the one that's great. It could be the one that is always on that pedestal and can do that no wrong. And then there's the one that is always the scapegoat, the, the person you're going to immediately assume did something wrong. Whether they did or not, you're going to assume the worst. They are the one. But there's also the one who can be argumentative, who can be unhappy, who can be negative in the workplace, who sometimes is toxic in a workplace, and he or she is the one. And what's the leader's, what is the leader's job? What is the leader's role? Brian Brodeur, I see you looking at us right now. Um, why don't you just jump in over there because I'm going to get Brian in this conversation. By the way, Brian Brodeur um, runs a great operation. He's the leader of his company. By the way, tell everyone, Brian, the name of uh, the operation. Sure. We are East Main Media, formerly ACM Studios here in New Jersey. That's right. We're in, uh, what town are we in? Little Falls? Little Falls, New Jersey. It's a beautiful town. Brian, do you believe there's always the one yeah, it, it, it depends. You know, I mean, as a team leader here of our production company, um, I believe in puzzle piece fits. And so sometimes those puzzle piece fits are the one for their puzzle piece. So the ones can be different victories. You know, they could be different uh, successes in those different areas. You guys are all being so positive. I'm sorry. I'm gonna, he's I, being I, very nice. He, he's because he's nice. but and he's, My, and he's also well, a gentleman. No, but I'm going to push the issue. I'm not talking about that. And Mary, and you ducked me on this because Mary Gamma ducked oh, me. Oh, no, so, I, I no, was no, just you, about let you, yes. You were sitting there going, yeah, there's the one who's really good. All right, or, I'm not talking about that. That one's not the problem. I'm asking. In any situation, I, my wife has lots of friends. There's always one. My friend, there's always one. Right. On a team, there's always one. But on I'm talking, go ahead. Yes. And on a team, and Steve and I have had these types of conversations before, does there need to be that person? And, I didn't you say know, need to be. Uh, no, but in, in certain leaders' character, there sometimes may need to be the one who, and I'm not saying you, Steve, Go ahead. I'm saying we're talking leadership. I don't leadership. think everything revolves around me. Go ahead. A, a, we're talking broad leadership that in, and I, I have worked at other organizations, it feels like a lifetime ago, decades ago, um, and I noticed it there too. When you get to those top leaders and you get to know them, there's always the one, and if that one happens to move on, an, another one appears that, you know, oh, I, you expect the worst of that person. Mary, oh, you're, Mary's saying something different, Brian. She's saying that on the team, the leader is always looking for Correct. the one. And whether objectively that person exists or not, he or she as a leader have to has to identify someone as the one and treat them like the one. And sometimes it could be a kid. You could have three, four, or five kids, there's and always there's always one. that one. And, and I have a really close friend, and it's always, I'll just make up a name. It's always Brian. It's always Brian. And, you know. And, not, the, not this Brian in the studio. I swear not this Brian. It's not the one. I made up a name, and it's because I'm looking at Brian. Go ahead. But it is, and and it's always the one. If there's an on issue. On a sports uh, team, there's always the one with the negative oh, attitude. That one, yes. That one. Go ahead, Brian. Well, let me flip it around. Brian, right? By the way, Brian was running the show production-wise, and all of a sudden I said, <laughs> just jump in. Go just ahead. Just have to sit down. Um, let, let me flip that around for a second, because... Um, we have a saying here in our organization, everybody is not a square peg in a square hole. Everybody has their own shape. Everyone's an oblong shape. So if somebody has a weakness, they may be a puzzle fit for uh, someone else in the team or someone, for example, uh, our operations manager, Kayla Galka here, when she came in, her set of skills joining our team was such a puzzle fit for us because 
just walking in the door, her strengths fit so well with our negatives. So you may have someone who's a one that isn't really holding up or, or is that standout that needs help. Who's some, difficult. Who's difficult. But Kayla was the one who helped make it happen. Literally, she stepped in on day one and did things better than what I took 10 years to learn running a business and just walked in. So she was the one in a good way. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Good, but I'm not getting my question answered. Yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I pre what you just said made a lot of sense. What Mary just said made a ton of sense as well, which is that some leaders, and I'll just say this myself, I remember, and again, I, we've said this a million times, and if you read my book, uh, particularly the introduction, Lessons in Leadership, I talk about my dad. And I won't always talk about this on every show, but my dad always had to have a one, the one. He always... It didn't matter, but there was always one in a meeting who he would target, and that person would catch heck that day. I mean, big time. And I think on some level, I have picked up mm -hmm. that I've always got to identify the one. And if you remember, for a short time, the one was me. No way. The one was me, so I can— what? and And I'm not talking, you know, I'm just saying probably, you know, seven, six years ago You now, were the one? For a little while, and I may or may not have given my notice and said it's time for us to part ways because obviously, as any good marriage, all things come to an end at some point. Um, but we got past it because we spoke as adults and, and we put everything out on the table. Wow. But not everyone is that open— to taking that time to sit with their boss. And again, this is not about you. This is about just leadership Any in general. Any leader listening right now can help. Exactly. Can be helped by this. Exactly. And, you know, I like, again, we all have friends that work in different types of organizations. And, and I've talked about this a lot. There's always that one that just becomes the thorn in your side. <sighs> Brian, Brian's not going to, by the way, his whole team is here. That's Brian, they're <laughs> that listening. is true. Yeah. That if, makes if, it. If, if there's someone, and I, I believe objectively, if I've, we've had people on our team and people I've worked with. By the way, because I've contributed on certain national networks, I worked at MSNBC under contract for a while back. I've been at Fox. I've been at other places, CNN, and I've been part of PBS for a long time. I look at different departments. I don't, those people don't work for me, but I'm looking at the team going, oh, she's the one. He's the one. He's the one who's argumentative. He's the one who's negative. He's the one who, frankly, just doesn't want to go along with anything, not because they disagree objectively, because they're just going to be the one. Brian, I know you can't do that because your whole team is here, but please help me on this. Well, I have a perspective that— Then I'll get off this topic. I always look at it as the team, and I'm very much about protecting the team. And I know, Steve, you run your organization this way, too. I am not afraid of letting go a weak link— the one in that case. Because it will protect the success and integrity of our team. And I've seen that time and time again here. And I will preach that and communicate that to the team, all team members early on. So they know, hey, look, you know, if you are that one and you're going to be a thorn or you're going to be mm -hmm. troublesome, you're out the door because I have a team to protect. But it's what not if, about whoa. you. But oh, what if, go but, ahead, Mary. But I was just going to say. Mary but, Gamba, Steve Adubato, Brian Brodeur. Brian Brodeur. This is the leadership hour. Go ahead, Mary. Yes, but what if the one really isn't the one? Meaning that the one that is perceived to be the one because the leader perceives that he or she has many weaknesses, but really it's and not. And is it's, negative. Go ahead. Okay. And what if that's just because the leader has some preconceived notion that there always has to be the one, but that person really isn't the one, but it's just because there's no one else and then they become a target. Let's bring in Dr. Phil to solve this. because I, I do have a degree in psychology, by the way, which actually works very well. Oh, yeah. um, Go ahead, Brian. My day -day Take job. that one on. <laughs> well, let me try to translate what you're asking, which is if a leader has she's saying the problem sorry for interrupting Brian. She, yeah. Brian she's saying and we'll get off this after this she's saying the leader's got the issue she's saying the leader needs a whipping I don't mean this literally whipping boy or whipping girl and he or she's got an issue where nothing could be copacetic nothing could be you know what there isn't going to be a one unless there's really a one and I'm going to allow for peace and tranquility and I don't have to find a target that's what she means I think that at least in my experience, that's manifested as the bar is never high enough. Right. And then that can be turned into, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to make you the example of not living up to what I expect. And everyone else is going to learn from me oh. taking it out on you. Yeah, they become the example. So it's a great point. You know, that's a leadership failing because there has to be a point where you have to say, hey, look, you are making you you are meeting the bar. Uh, and that can be positive reinforcement, not battering something that actually turns into bullying, frankly. What? It oh, can turn oh, oh. into bullying. Okay. Mm. That's not how we run our shop here, certainly. Um, well, by the way, uh, 
let's do this. We can't take a break, right? We can do whatever you want, Steve. That's the beauty of the Leadership Hour, the Steve Adubato mm -hmm. Leadership Hour with Mary Gamba. And Brian Brodeur clearly contributes to the leadership because he's a leader. I love when people say, I'm not a leader. You're not a leader. Yeah, I just run a company. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I, I run a department. I'm not a leader. It's ridiculous. We're all leaders. It's a question of how good we are and whether our, we have a commitment to growing and learning, and that's what this Leadership Hour is about. Steve Adubato will be right back right after this. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Steve Adubato back here with Mary Gamba. This is the Leadership Hour on AM 970. Also, check us out on our website, stand dash deliver.com. I want to thank our colleague and friend uh, and associate Brian Brodeur who just joined us. Uh, Mary, can we do this in the few minutes we have left? Coaching and mentoring. I said before that it has to become part of your DNA. You have to coach and mentor and make it part of your life as a leader. And a lot of the folks that I've coached over the years have told me things like, quote, I'd love to coach and mentor my people. I'm just too busy doing what I do every day. What's the difference between being a super doer and a great leader? Because the great doers who tell me they don't have time to coach and mentor, you know, they would like to, they're not real leaders. You're talking to the right person because years ago I was that person who- The super doer? Wanted to close my door, wanted to put my phone on do not disturb. And trust me, there are days when I need to because there are deadlines that need to be met. But the best leaders are those that understand that having that door open, coaching and mentoring your team, not waiting for them to come to you to say they have an issue, checking in, touching base, and sitting down face-to-face -face with your team just to see how they're doing is one of the biggest keys to leadership. When people say they don't have the time to coach and mentor, what are the consequences of not doing it? You are, without a doubt, you will get a team that is disengaged. They're not going to be motivated. They're not going to be able to buy into whatever it is because, frankly, they're not going to be hearing it from you from the top down, the importance of, and also, too, frankly, you're coaching and mentoring them so then they could, in turn, coach and mentor one another and be there for one another. So if they see you closing your door and shutting down, they're gonna close their door and just get their work done and be good little worker bees and get their widgets done and then leave at the end of the day. But that's not acceptable for organizations that are gonna grow. You know, it's so interesting in terms of um, receiving feedback. I was coaching someone a while back. I don't even know if I ever told Mary this, um, but I was coaching someone a while back who, my job when I sit down with someone to coach them is to ask right out of the box, where do you think your greatest strengths as a leader are, as well as where do you think the opportunities for growth and development are? Steve Adubato here with Mary Gamba. This is the Leadership Hour. And um, I remember asking this. It was a bank executive. And I asked him, um, where do you think your greatest leadership is? We'll call him Bob because that was his name, Bob. So uh, <laughs> Bob's, Real subtle. No, nice. His, nice uh... his name wasn't Bob. I'm just making it up. So, so Bob said, I'm great at getting feedback in meetings because I'm open to lots of different ideas. So I said, well, what do you need to work on? And he had a hard time identifying anything as if you were perfect. So I said, Bob, I have a suggestion. Why don't I come watch you lead a meeting and I'll give you my assessment of how you lead a meeting and the way you are with engaging. He kept saying, I get people so engaged. So the point of the story is I went to the meeting. I'm in the back of the room trying to be as um, invisible as possible. And Bob starts the meeting. He's like, all right, look, we have to cut the budget. We have to cut the advertising budget by 10% over the next six months. Any ideas as to how to do that? And I don't see any hands go up right away. I'm thinking, this isn't a good sign. And then, I don't know, 20 seconds later, her hand goes up. He goes, Jane, any ideas? And she goes, yes. I'm thinking, Bob, that the billboards that we're putting up out there, I'm not convinced that there's any real ROI, return on investment. I think it's not the greatest investment. Before she even got halfway through, he goes, Jane, did I ask for stupid ideas? I asked for a productive idea as to how to cut the budget. Those billboards were my idea, and there isn't a way in the world we are going to take those billboards down. Those billboards are effective. I like them. I help design them. Is this a true story? True story. He turned around and he said... Next suggestion, and I watched crickets, dead silence. And he said, come on. You remember the Ferris Bueller movie? Oh, yeah. Bueller, With, Bueller, anyone, anyone Bueller. Anyone, Bueller. <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> and afterwards, I swear the meeting ends, right? 
And I sit down with him and he says to me, Don't even say that he asked how he did. Word for word. I can't believe you just said it. He said, Steve, how do you think I did? And I said, Bob. And I recounted what I thought happened and was clearly objective, right? And he said, oh, come on. That was a stupid idea. I said, but Bob, you told me your greatest attribute is getting feedback from other people and engaging them. Go ahead, jump in. Got two minutes left. Yeah, but only if it's good feedback. Obviously, this Bob, he will only be happy if it's feedback that he perceives is good. So if it's something- Or that he wants to hear. Or that he wants to hear. Or something that maybe wasn't his idea, because apparently those billboards were his idea. So, you know, shame on that employee for not realizing that, because that probably wasn't the greatest thing. So I think it's a matter of really being and practicing what you preach and just being that leader in that room. How cool but is... Hold on, Mary. I, I'm just in shock right now. I've never heard the story. This is the first I'm hearing it with the listeners today. You ready for this? I think this happened early on before... I was doing some coaching before you mm-hmm. actually joined Stand and Deliver. That's stand-deliver.com for yes. a whole bunch of free information about leadership and communication. I think it was before that, but we have about a minute left. What was really striking to me is that he thought that his greatest attribute was the thing I thought he absolutely was horrific at. And so really the point I want to make here is the degree of self-awareness that you need to be a really good leader about what you're good at, but more importantly, where you need and you must get better, what the opportunities for growth and development and improvement are. I have to tell you, in my coaching of like 15, 20 years in doing this, I find the most people's sense of themselves, and then, you know, we do a 360, which mm-hmm. means we ask and, that and person say the same to thing. ask several different people around them what their strengths are and where they can develop and grow. Very rarely do they match up. 30 seconds left. Yeah. Go ahead. If And it's one thing to even know what those weaknesses are, but to have the courage to, number one, admit what they are for yourself, what those weaknesses are, and then knowing what to do about them, it's two totally different things. It's like saying I need to lose 30 pounds is easy, but then actually making that change in the commitment is really hard, and it's the same in leadership. You ever hear people in a marriage say, oh my God, my wife really appreciates what I do and I'm so involved in helping with the kids and I help around the house and, and I'm just I'm just there for her. And you ask um, his wife and she says, he's not connected. He doesn't seem to care very much about what goes on and he's not very helpful. I'm thinking, hmm, marriage therapy on a different edition of the Leadership Hour with Steve Adubato and Mary Gamba. So Mary, that's it. Half hour went by so fast. It always does. It's a lot of fun. And by the way, what can they check out on the second half hour of the Leadership Hour? State of Affairs with Steve Adubato. On AM 970. This is Steve Adubato. Check us out next Sunday at 2 p.m. on AM 970. And check out our podcast on our website, stand com. Steve Adubato, talking leadership every week. We'll be right back. No, we won't. We'll be back next week. This is Mary Gamba. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, where we look at the most pressing issues facing the state of New Jersey. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources. Hi, I'm Barry Ostrowski. At RWJ Barnabas Health, we believe that everyone needs to be informed about the important health care issues affecting their lives. That's why we're proud to support the important educational programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at Two Gateway. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, Delta Dental of New Jersey. Everyone deserves a healthy smile. The Turrell Fund. Supporting Right from the Start, NJ. The Nicholson Foundation. Supporting Right from the Start, NJ. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. NJ Best. New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan. Turn a dream into a degree. And by New Jersey Sharing Network. Dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. This is State of Affairs. We, in fact, are coming to you from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio in Newark, New Jersey. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sharif Elnahal, who is the commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Health. Commissioner, good to see you. Thanks so much, Steve. Tell folks a little bit about your background before you came into this post. Sure. I actually grew up in New Jersey in Atlantic County. Uh, I grew up between Galloway Township and Linwood. Uh, Went to high school at Mainland Regional. Uh, and I've spent most of my career actually outside New Jersey before being afforded the opportunity 
to come back here and serve. Uh, ended up going to medical school up in Boston, also got an MBA up there, and decided to really focus on not just healthcare provision as a physician, uh, but the systems of care that support uh, mm. folks on the front lines. And so got into operations management, quality, safety, ultimately policy, served mm. in the Obama administration at the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, where the governor became aware of the work that we were doing. And I was really glad to come back and do this, in this role. Yeah. By the way, I, I was talking with the commission before we got on. This, is, in fact, is the unofficial start, if you will, of a series of programs simply focusing on the future of health care in New Jersey, also in the nation, but our mandate, if you will, is New Jersey. This is, in fact, the future of health care. Let me ask you, to that end, Commissioner, how confident are you about the future of health care in this state, A and B? What are the biggest challenges we face? I'm really confident about it, Steve. And the reason I say that is everybody I've met from hospital executives uh, to folks on the front lines like community health workers who are in our inner cities, finally reaching communities that uh, we failed to reach thus far for some of our public health issues, uh, all the way to business leaders and folks that you normally wouldn't think have a hand in health care, but ultimately do by improving the economy and improving people's well-being, all of them are ready to start building an innovation economy here in New Jersey. What does that mean? That means starting to bring in new ideas, new entrepreneurs, people who are actually creating new solutions for some of our toughest healthcare problems. And part of what we're focused on in the Department of Health is not just, of course, improving public health outcomes, but also bringing innovation to the table and to have New Jersey essentially become the Silicon Valley for healthcare and new technology, new solutions for these issues. It's interesting. One of the issues that we were talking about before we got in the air involves technology as well. There's a report that was put out that really talks about the end of life, end of life issues. 25% of all New Jerseyans die in hospitals. And actually, the Nicholson Foundation funded a study that the Healthcare Quality Institute uh, put together. Why is it relevant that so many people die in hospitals and so much money is spent on quote unquote end of life care disproportionately in New Jersey? Why is that an important issue? Steve, I spoke at that event recently uh, commemorating this report and how important it is. It's a really important issue. The fact is uh, people are not getting treated the way they should near the end of life. And the first step is, of course, asking people well before uh, they are in the emergency room or on their deathbed how they want, how they envision uh, the final days of their life. Uh, do they envision it at home? Uh, are you treating their pain? Are you treating their symptoms early on? There are studies that show, Steve, that when you do that properly, not only does your quality of life improve as a patient, uh, your well-being improves, your family member's well-being, and even your lifespan is extended if you're offered end-of-life care the right way earlier on in your disease process. But there has to be an honest discussion about this. It really has And we're to not be. where we need to be. We're not. We uh, do not record people's preferences for care, their goals of care. Uh, we provide the most aggressive care out of any state in the country. Aggressive meaning expensive. Expensive is part of it, but right. also uh, we're doing procedures. We're uh, keeping people uh, alive, uh, oftentimes not knowing what their preference would have been uh, otherwise. And this is all about matching what people want out of their mm. uh, life into their care. And mm -hmm. we're not doing that right. Can I get a quick on this? We're collaborating with the New Jersey Sharing Network, Oregon Tissue Donation. Um, by the way, look at our website or connect to theirs to find out more about organ and tissue donation. What is the role of the Department of Health in the whole question of organ and tissue donation? Because there are at least four to 5,000 New Jerseyans waiting right now for an organ. Yeah. So uh, we, of course, maintain the registries and have a role uh, in organ donation. A lot of that is carried out, of course, by the hospitals and the hospital system. We communicate regularly with them to understand uh, what the supply and demand is for organs, and we have a role to play in that. It's an important one as well because we want to make sure that we're supporting uh, the folks in the front lines doing transplants um, and connected well to the trauma system. We have an advisory committee on trauma uh, that addresses some of these issues as well. You know, I was watching, uh, as most people do, NJTV News. We're actually taping right here in the studio at NJTV in Newark. And you were talking about, I'm not sure if it was a conference or what it was, but there was a comprehensive report on the opioid crisis in this state. You and your colleagues at the department are very involved. Talk about it. Yeah. Uh, we are on track, Steve, to have over 3,000 deaths from opioid overdoses this year. 3,000. 3,000. Uh, that number is much too high. It's not getting better. 
Uh, in the last administration, there were a lot of good laws passed that's starting to get us there, but we haven't had yet a comprehensive public health approach. What does that mean? That means tracking the journey of someone from their initial exposure uh, to opioids through addiction, through incarceration, overdose, and death, trying to make sure that people are not passing through each of those gates uh, through effective interventions. Uh, part of that battle, uh, the governor has been out front saying this as well, is extending medicinal marijuana to folks with chronic pain. You believe uh, that's the right thing? I do. Uh, it, there's a lot of evidence to say that it's an effective treatment for pain uh, of many types, both from joints and bones and mm. muscles, uh, all the way to organ pain. Uh, study after study has shown that it's effective. We want to make sure we're getting it to as many people as possible who we think can benefit. And we want that decision to be made by physicians on the front line who are seeing these patients. Steve Arbato here. We're, in fact, speaking to the commissioner of the Department of Health, Dr. Sharif Al Nahal. Um, question about, an interesting and complicated question about um, in infant and, and, and um, toddler care. What is the role of the Department of Health? We actually have, Jackie help me on this, Jackie Hire, producer, we have the head of the Department of um, Families and Children coming in and we're doing an initiative dealing with questions revolving the health issues impacting infants and toddlers. Does the state have a role, excuse me, the Department of Health have a role in that? Absolutely. Because I know work. it's broken down to a lot, a lot of the state agencies. It is. Uh, but we work very closely with the Department of Children and Families on a lot of projects. Uh, one of the programs we have is called the Women, Infants, and Children Program. We're That's trying to... WIC? WIC, yes. Right. Uh, our, our, our initiative is right from the start, NJ. You'll see up on the screen. Go ahead. Yeah. And the entire idea behind that program is to provide support, services, access to healthy food, uh, for vulnerable communities, folks that are not being reached uh, through food deserts and different mm -hmm. things that uh, allow them to access healthy food. Uh, but also things like uh, breastfeeding, training, mm -hmm. um, you know, making sure we're supporting mothers, uh, new mothers uh, in communities in the inner city that we're not able to get to with the traditional structure of the healthcare system. Commissioner, why is, um, again, Commissioner Alan Hall is in the house, Steve Adubato here. The question is also about infant mortality and why the rate is so much higher for African-American babies? It's really terrible, Steve. We have among the lowest uh, infant mortality rates in the country, but you can't celebrate that knowing that, at best, the black infant mortality rate is double uh, across the state. In some places, quadruple. It's because we simply have not reached the communities that we need to reach with our outreach efforts. Uh, we don't have the infrastructure there for people to receive prenatal care. Uh, the social stressors on black women in New Jersey, uh, we toxic found... Toxic stress, as uh, one of the doctors actually we talked to called it. It is toxic. Absolutely. What does that mean? That means they are not able to tend to themselves and by definition to their child. If they have so many different social stressors, there's uh, employment uh, issues. There, these, many of these women are being forced to go back to work in a matter of days mm. uh, after they give birth. So we're talking about levels of stress that most women in New Jersey are not experiencing. And so we need to get to the root cause of these issues. It's one of the first things I asked my public health team to do. And we're already on track to do uh, a lot for that problem. By the way, uh, before we, uh, we have another couple questions for the commissioner, log on to our website. Um, there's an article by Dr. Arturo Brito, who wrote about this whole question of toxic stress, which I never had heard before he said it. But, but real quick on this, the future of the Affordable Care Act in New Jersey and the nation is? Uh, that is an open question, Steve. I'll tell you question. what we're trying to do in New Jersey. We're trying to stave yeah. off the continued attacks on the gains we've made with the Affordable Care Act uh, that are coming from the Trump administration. We passed historic legislation establishing the first individual mandate since right. Massachusetts did it well before the Affordable Care Act. <clears throat> That'll hopefully stabilize the exchanges. We're also going to have a reinsurance plan uh, that essentially covers the cost of some of the sickest patients in the exchange. That should help lower premiums and, of course, therefore have more people enrolling. And, of course, we're going to promote the Affordable Care Act open enrollment period way more than we have been before. Even though the federal Jersey. government has cut back on the amount of money you can use to, quote, unquote, promote and educate. Am I wrong about that? No, they've cut Go back ahead, on the money. They've cut back on the open enrollment period. So it used to be uh, two, uh, three months. Now it's only six weeks. So these are all intentional actions that are being taken in Washington to undermine the Affordable Care Act. And the people paying for it, Steve, are the patients, the people who've benefited from coverage, the people who've gotten treatment for diseases they've had for a long yeah. time but were denied based on their pre-existing conditions. You're listening to Dr. Sharif Al Nahal, Commissioner of the Department of Health in the state of New Jersey. I want to thank you for joining us here on State of Affairs. Hopefully you'll continue to 
uh, be a part of our conversation on the future of healthcare in New Jersey and the nation. We appreciate you joining us. Thanks so much. Thank Steve. you, Commissioner. All the best. Thank you. Okay. We'll be right back right after this. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. State of Affairs is pleased to welcome Kevin Lyons, Associate Professor for the Department of Supply Chain Management at Rutgers Business School. Good to see you, Kevin. Nice to see you as well, Steve. Um, first of all, describe supply chain management. Supply chain management came out of an academic exercise of taking procurement operations research and then formalizing it so that when you are in a major corporation, let's say, and you need to acquire goods and services, that you do it in a formalized way and that all your uh, agents and customers along the way are, are in that chain. So it's uh, actually literal what it says. We want supply, but push it through a chain. Let's bring it uh, into Newark. There's an initiative that we've done some programming on. Um, we've talked to uh, Roz Baraka, the mayor of Newark, <coughs> excuse my voice, mm -hmm. and others, uh, particularly folks at RWJ Barnabas Health, who have talked about this and as, as a part of their social impact initiative. It's called Hire, Buy, Live Newark, right? That's correct. Your team at Rutgers is part of the... Buy local. Buy local. Correct. What does that mean, buy local? When we're in Newark right now, we want everyone right. to buy local, support the economy, but what is Rutgers doing? So when we look at buy local, we're looking at the large institutions. So that's Rutgers, NJIT, Prudential, uh, NJPAC, Audible. And what are their buying patterns? So are we actually targeting our purchasing into the local economy so we can actually grow? the local economy. So instead of uh, business as usual, where we can get goods and services anywhere in the world, could we refocus that uh, procurement activity to our local economy, our local small business, women-owned, minority-owned businesses, and then lift them as part of the uh, economic development? You know, as I'm thinking about this, you are talking about PSCNG, NJPAC, Prudential Financial, Prudential Center, Rutgers, NJIT, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. as part of this initiative. How challenging is it to get folks who historically have been hiring people in a certain way, right. certain culture. Talent pool is huge. And you say, you know what? There's a lot of talent here in Newark. Yes. And we're asking you to try to find that talent, recruit that talent, train that talent hard. Yeah, what it really boils down to is that keep your same processes. HR is always going to be HR. But can we expand that reach to include our Newark residents? Why should that be a thing? It shouldn't be a thing. <laughs> I'm sitting it's, there going, you're in Newark. It's a big labor pool. Is there something, is there, there is, devil's advocate, is right. there a perception that there's something wrong with the labor, labor pool? No, not at all. And I think because we're in a globalized economy, you can get talent, you can get goods, you can get anything you need to make your organization great from anywhere. Hmm. But what we're saying is that that talent also exists right outside your back door. So why don't we try to refocus that energy develop those pathways in our schools to start to prepare the type of talent that you're looking for. What so, does that mean, prepare them, pathways to school? That means that when we start to think about these really important careers that we have in these large institutions, why are we not preparing our kids literally as far back as grade school to start How? thinking about, hey, we want technology, then guess what? We're going to invest the time and the effort to make sure that we are making our schools uh, graduate the type of talent that we need. So this way we don't have to go searching globally. We can Are the schools ready for that or does Rutgers play a role in that training of younger people? Yeah, Rutgers is, uh, the schools are ready. And Rutgers needs to forge partnerships not only with the schools, but our county colleges need to be involved in this. Our trade schools need to be involved in this. We also have, you know, kids that are not destined to go to college. So how do we prepare them enough so that when they do graduate from high school, that there is an opportunity for them here in Newark as well? So we have to look at the entire spectrum. You know, for someone outside of Newark, people watching us all over, you can imagine them saying, well, you know, what about us? Right. You say? Well, you're part of it. You need to be engaged. We need to be engaged with you. So this is going to be more of a proactive approach. We have to reach out. So instead of in the past where we just sit back and wait for talent to come to us, we have to put our HR folks on steroids to get them out there to do the, uh, the job fairs, 
to get folks like myself, I'm not an HR person, but I should be advertising the fact that... As opposed that to passive, hey, let's see who applies? Exactly. That doesn't work. It doesn't work because, you know, you know, not everybody's, you know, on the web. Not everybody's doing the tech, uh, technology as we think we, they probably are. But we need to do, yeah. go back to the old days of actually going out in the streets and actually pulling folks in. Yeah, but you got me thinking about this in the time we have left, Kevin. There are, mm -hmm. For years, I mean, growing up in Newark and, and doing a lot of our business in and around Newark, you'd hear people say, there are not enough jobs. If there were only more jobs, there would be fewer kids on the street and, and young adults uh, involved in activities they shouldn't be involved in, drugs, alcohol, uh, crime, et cetera. But are the jobs you're talking about, jobs that a lot of the folks we're talking about are trained for A and B, what can we do to pull those folks in and give them an opportunity? Yes, yeah, so there are opportunities, the jobs are there, but we also have to be very strategic. You know, there are different jobs and different positions and all these different anchor institutions. So Rutgers jobs are different than Prudential jobs. By the way, an anchor institution is? Anchor institution is a legacy uh, institute. It used to be eds and meds or educational institutions and medical uh, facilities that made up the, the, uh, the anchor, in a sense, of the economy. But now we've expanded that to include corporations and government entities as well. So these are their traditional big hiring entities within a, uh, in a city. But we can prepare them. We can make sure that they have all the opportunities that are necessary. But this is a, a, a slow process. It's something that will take some time. But the investment is ultimately going to be worth it. Kevin Lyons is associate professor for the Department of Supply Chain Management at my alma mater, Rutgers, Rutgers Business School, yes. more specifically. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. All the best to the folks Appreciate at Rutgers. It. Thank you very much. Okay. We'll you. be back right after this. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're pleased to be joined by Tony Russo, president of the Commerce and Industry Association of New Jersey. Good to see you, my friend. Happy to be here, Steve. Thank you. Uh, the state of commerce, uh, by the way, your website will be up throughout this entire segment. The state of commerce in the state of New Jersey, how would you describe it? I mean, at this point, uh, tentative. I think a lot of our businesses are, are worried, concerned about what's going to happen in Trenton with the budget and, and the taxes and whether or not we're going to have taxes or not have taxes. So I would say tentative but cautiously optimistic. I mean, so business is good, but I'm waiting to see what happens. By the way, when Tony says that we're doing this right before the budget is supposed to be struck in the state of New Jersey toward the end of June 2018, it will air after that. But let's talk big picture. You talk to business leaders all the time. If, in fact, there is a quote-unquote millionaire's tax, an increase taxes on millionaires, I believe, help me on the, I think it's eight point right now, it's... 8.9%. Point, it could go up to... 10.25, I think. 10.25. Someone says, what's only a good percentage or so? What's the big deal? What impact, if that were to happen, do you think it would have? Yeah, because I think it's a cumulative effect. So when you think about that one tax combined with all the other taxes that our businesses pay, uh, I think there needs to be an appreciation that a millionaire's tax, a lot of the millionaires, and I think there are about 18,000 in New Jersey, also employ a lot of our residents. Mm -hmm. uh, they own the small businesses. Um, and so they're going to take that all into account, and I think the, the impact will be that those millionaires will decide whether or not the view is worth the climb and whether or not they should leave the state. What happens when a business leaves the state? And by the way, where do they go, Tom? Uh, a lot of them uh, relocate to Pennsylvania, right next Lower door. tax rate? Yeah, Delaware, New York. Lower tax rate? Lower tax rate. Florida, different. no taxes? Florida, no, no income taxes, tax. no income tax in Florida. So it, it's a cumulative effect. It's a pancake effect. I mean, so you put one pancake on another. Each one is a tax, a fee. And then when they take it big picture, they'll say, you know what, it's time maybe to move elsewhere. Okay, uh, by the way, talking to Tony Russo from the Commerce and Industry Association of New Jersey. Um, by the way, we happen to be promotional colleagues. We cross-promote each other's work. Uh, but I'm curious about something. What about those who say, you know what, people who have the most should pay their fair share. So what are they complaining about, you say? Yeah, and, I, and they do. I mean, a lot of our companies uh, give back to the local community, charitable good works. Again, it's not a question of whether or not they should uh, are paying those taxes. What our companies want to see that the, the Trenton, the lawmakers, also take a look at cut and spending. 
And that's something that's not happening right now. There's all the talk about raising the corporate business tax, the millionaire's tax. Yes, the by the way, Senator, tax. as we, sorry for interrupting, um, the Senate President Steve Sweeney was right here on this set on NJTV uh, talking about a corporate tax. Governor Murphy is proposing a millionaire's tax, an increase in the sales tax. We don't know what's going to happen. We'll see. Cumulative effect. But the cumulative effect in that, and really what I wanted to say, what's absent in the discussions, right, in yeah. Trenton right now between the governor and the state legislature is any talk of really spending cuts. And I think that has to be put Excuse on the Excuse me, table. the proposed budget, again, we don't know what's going to happen, is, is an increase, is it one point, help me on the number, Michael Aaron, who's in the newsroom, he'd have this number, I think it's one point five, one point five billion, billion dollars. That's not a cut. Well, but, the, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is that to your question, do our businesses want to pay those taxes? They would pay those fair taxes if, if there's also discussion on trying to cut spending in Trenton. So if you're short a billion dollars, I think you're obligated to also look at the programs and see where you can save some money and make some cuts before you go to raising the taxes. But also the other thing I want to mention, too, is the fact that the third item here, and we say it all the time when we testify, is they should look at increase, Testify before the legislature. I'm sorry, before the legislature, is in, increasing the tax base. So the number of entities that actually pay the taxes. More people paying. So bring that investment into New Jersey. Okay, how about this? State and local deductions, SALT. Right? Soft, right. The Trump administration argues biggest tax cut years stimulating the economy. But in states like New Jersey, Tony, speaking to Tony Russo from Commerce and Industry Association, it's a $10,000 cap on which you can write off on your taxes for your state taxes and your property taxes. And I live in Montclair. Let's just say we pay our fair share and then some. But then you got the state income tax. You can only write off 10 grand. That's it. Most folks in New Jersey. They pay a lot more than that in state and local property taxes, right? Yep. That's killing people. How is that making sense for a state like New Jersey? It, it doesn't, and that's one part of the governor's proposed budget that we actually support, is he wants to raise that cap for that SALT or state and local taxes up to 15000 So that's one thing that he proposed back in March that we actually, as a business community, support. Hold on, I want to be clear. That cap. The state is saying let's raise the cap from 10,000 to 15. And the Internal Revenue Service in Washington is saying, hold on one second. We have a new federal tax law. You can't mess around in a state and change that. That's a federal issue, not a state issue. Well, it's not. It's the deduction that I'm allowed to take at the okay. state level. So this is on your state income taxes. Oh, on your state on, income yes. taxes. I'm sorry. Not on so the, your your cap will go up to 15,000. I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, I'm not an accountant. No, no, no but, but I will say this. It's hurting a lot of people. Yeah, it that, is. That deduction. And it's a mixed bag. It's All a right. mixed bag. Um, by the way, what do you think most, mm, let me switch gears on this. Gateway Tunnel, I've been asking everybody this issue. It sounds like an infrastructure issue. have got a minute left. Gateway Tunnel, New, Jer New York, New Jersey, going through Lincoln. Tunnel, how important is it to our state? It's so important to our state that at the Commerce and Industry Association, we launched a transportation forum dedicated just to focus on transportation issues. Not only in our roads, bridges, and tunnels, but also ports, seaport, airport. We want to try to bring it all together and try to improve how our products and services are delivered. Is that a commerce issue? It's absolutely a commerce issue, absolutely. And we support the, the funding of it. We hope it's funded totally. We, we the gateway tunnel. The gateway tunnel. But I think we need a state transportation plan on trying to move traffic around the state. I think it all needs to be tied together. It's interesting. People say it's a transportation issue, but in fact, it's an issue that involves commerce, economic development, quality of life, traffic. It's all tied together. Uh, yeah. Anthony Russo is the president of the Commerce and Industry Association of New Jersey. Also, by the way, check out their magazine. It is, in fact, called? Commerce Magazine. It's amazing how that yes. happened. This is Steve Arbaugh. It's State of Affairs. Catch you next time. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Tom. you, Steve. Thank you. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, Delta Dental of New Jersey, the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ. The Nicholson Foundation, supporting right from the start NJ. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, NJ Best, and by New Jersey Sharing Network. Promotional support provided by Jaffe Communications, where business, media, and government converge in New Jersey. And by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. What is your child's dream for the future? Doctor? Teacher? Architect? 
Whatever they aspire to be, a college education may realize those dreams. And NJ Best can help. It's the college savings plan specifically designed for New Jersey families. Start saving today with as little as $25, because now is the time to invest in their future. To learn about NJ Best 529 College Savings Plan, its investment objectives, risks, and costs, read the Investor Handbook available at njbest.com.